Hi, I'm Polly. I'm going to tell you a bit about the chemistry we're doing with our favourite area of the periodic table. And for us, that's the F block. So sometimes people call them the footnotes of the periodic table. But what do people really know about them? They're right at the bottom here. We all know that from school. Um, and they're technology critical. So the 4F, the rare earths or the lanthanides here, uh, many of them are essential, but like spices of technology. So they exist in small amounts in mobile phones, in magnets, uh, very strong magnets, um, and in batteries, and they're additives to things, which makes them difficult to recycle because they're spread out across the, across the technology devices that we use. And then if we think about the actinides, this is where we know significantly less. Right? So we get to uranium here, which is the heaviest naturally occurring element. Um, and this is the one that everyone will have heard of because of nuclear waste, nuclear power. Um, but we can find devices and, and applications, uses for all of these in a variety of different areas. So why do we want to study their chemistry? Because we don't know enough about them. Um, this is what the textbooks will tell you. The 4Fs, the lanthanides, this top row here, are large and uh, form highly charged uh, acidic trications and they have high coordination numbers and they will bind things like water uh, and exchange those very rapidly. And then as you go down to the actinides at the beginning here, they uh, actually are so get, can, they can reach higher charges and so they will deprotonate the waters that bind to them and form these dioxodications. So um, they have a, a generally higher charge that's mopped up by these two linear, very strongly bonding oxygen atoms and then the remainder of their equatorial belt will fill up with solvent molecules, so donors that can just rapidly exchange around this belt. Um, and as you get to the other end, the heavier end of the actinides, you go back to this normal plus three uh, charged cation that has, again, this very high coordination number. And what else do we know about them? They're very strongly radioactive for the bottom row, but for the top row, this, of course, is not a problem except for one promethium that we don't see. We need to know much more about them than this because their fundamental bonding and, and structure and reactivity is really important for us to be able to look after our nuclear waste in the future and for us to not just uh, waste these technology critical elements and uh, throw away these batteries and, and magnets the way we currently do. So what our group tries to do is to get away from this aqueous environment standard and move into a regime where we can control where the electrons go. So we're interested in taking an organic structure. So here we would call it a ligand. It's a basically a framework that you can put around your cations. So here, the uranyl, where it has, used to have these rapidly exchanging uh, solvent molecules in the belt, we can now protect it and put other things around it here. And we can do the same for these trications. We can block off most of the reactivity, and then we can look at single site reactivity. And this means we can start to harness things like these rapid ligand exchanges um, that we would see with water into just one confined area. And we can think about using them as catalysts. And then we can look at where the electrons go and how the orbitals are being used. And then we can understand better how to um, be more environmentally aware when we isolate our critical rare earths and use them for these technologies. And we can also think about better understanding how to safeguard our nuclear wastes for the future. So in addition to being useful in technology, um, such as batteries and magnets, we can also think of using the rare earths in, in catalysis. So because I mentioned that they're Lewis acidic, they are um, very good at binding oxygen donors. And our future renewable palette that comes from biomass are full of oxygen donors. So we have opportunities to do interesting catalytic chemistry with these oxygenates, such as lactide, which comes from corn, uh, and here's the molecular structure, or carbon dioxide. I'm going to focus more on lactide later. And then the other part of our palette of future biorenewables will come from the, uh, the hydrocarbon segment, which will hopefully replace fossil fuels. So this gives us methane, uh, currently coming from fracking, and in the future, coming from methane and biogas. And then the other renewable source, the other future feedstock that we still have, is all of the plastic waste that we should not be calling waste, that we should definitely be recycling and using as a high energy source. It's actually a misnomer 
that um, the rare earths are scarce. Uh, it's simply that environmentally it's difficult and costly to extract them at the moment and they occur in places that are not necessarily politically stable although in fact there are significant reserves in the US and in Canada. Um, so this is an abundance chart that shows you where they exist and in fact um, many are more copper than uh, common than copper or nickel um, and in fact cerium here is a byproduct of the mining of neodymium, which is used in wind turbine magnets, and you extract three times as much cerium as you do uh, neodymium. So a catalytic use for us would be fantastic. Uh, they have this high coordination number and fast exchange, which is what you want for a fast catalyst to be able to pick up substrates. And they're also very low toxicity. So you have to eat six times as much cerium as you would iron, to get the same lethal dose in a series of rats. You can see it's similar to salt, sodium chloride. I don't think that's how they actually work, by the way. And of course, there are so many of them that once you find the catalyst that you think is halfway good, you can start to tune it. So you can move along the size because they change in size gently as you go along the series, which is a useful feature, um, changing these two properties at the same time as you move along the series. And uranium here is the heaviest naturally occurring element and is the one that we know most about. And is a very valuable uh, resource for us because it's a source of uh, clean energy, uh, so long as we can look after all of its waste products, of course. The way we get energy out of uranium is to take the 235 isotope, bombard it with neutrons, and then when it releases uh, fission products or daughter products here, it also releases a lot of energy, which is what's basically uh, behaving um, uh, where this reactor here is basically behaving like a kettle. So the heat release boils water and functions as any other power plant would. So here's the thing we need to take care of. If we're going to use uranium as a source of clean energy, we need to make sure that we can look after all of the daughter products that we make when we run this fission process. So uh, in addition to uh, the uranium that's left over because the rods aren't completely burnt, we make products of neutron capture, so these are non-naturally occurring elements. And then all of these coloured elements are also produced um, either because they were used in the cladding of the fuel or different isotopes of them will be the daughter products from the radiation. We need to be able to curate and look after lots of these because many are either short-lived or long-lived radioactive isotopes. So we need to make sure that we safeguard the future with these. And I use this picture to remind me that there are additional levels of complexity to deal with because every single nuclear reactor is different. So um, the different wastes will be formed, different compositions of waste will be formed from different types of fuels and different types of reactor. And the French have been very careful in dealing with this right from the beginning. So they have 200 types of cheese and only one type of reactor. Whereas in America, we have many, many types of reactors, and I'll let you be the judge of whether this can be described as cheese. Or not. So these are our current plans for um, how we deal with nuclear waste. Right now, uh, the rods of uranium oxide, um, before they go into the reactor, are fine. You can show them to anybody you like. Um, but after they've been burnt, they have all these highly radioactive daughter products, and so they're smoking hot, and we can't uh, handle them. We have to use cartoon characters to handle them at this point. Or what we actually do, of course, is we put them in these uh, very carefully in these swimming pools. They're not swimming pools, they're pools um, of water. Uh, we keep them temperature controlled and we keep them there for about three years while the most radioactive isotopes decay fast. And then the future plans are to bury them. So under Yucca Mountain or in various geological repositories. But of course, this storage is still going to require a significant amount of curation because many of these are very long lived. So one thing that many people are advocating for is to clean up the spent fuel a lot before we start to safeguard it. So if you can separate out the 4X, the lanthanides from the actinides, that's called partitioning, you can then take some of the longest lived really nasty actinides and you can bombard them separately with neutrons and convert them, transmute them into other isotopes that have shorter half-lives and that you don't have to store for so long. Um, and the reason that you can't do this with the whole mixture is because the lanthanides absorb neutrons strongly. 
And this is a graph that nicely shows how this would work. So if the red line shows if you have no separation, then you have to store your nuclear waste for well over a million years before it reaches natural uranium radiotoxicity. But if you separate them out, you can dramatically reduce the amount of time you have to store it. So to the order of thousands of years, we can think of um, buildings that have been standing for that long. So we can imagine curating our waste that long. Whereas if we think about how long the oldest surviving civilization that we know about has existed, this doesn't really take us out to this area here when the cockroaches will be ruling the earth. And we would love to argue that um, there's an ulterior motive for persuading people to separate these out. Because if you look at this smorgasbord picture of all the isotopes and elements that are formed as daughter products, you can see some really valuable products in there. And these metals are really important in other areas of catalysis. So a kilo of spent fuel makes a lot of rhodium and a lot of ruthenium, and there isn't very much of these on the planet at the moment. And of course, the alchemist's dream, you could also say gold, although unfortunately, gold is only made in certain types of reactors. And so you can see as chemists, uh, the capabilities we have to understand the subtle differences between all the different orbitals that the metals may use to form these complexes is what will help us to chemically separate these ions and isotopes before we want to bombard whichever ones it is with neutrons and to store the rest of them. And then we'll also be able to better understand how what will happen to them during the storage and how we'll be able to look after them for the long term future. So I want to talk first about catalytic reactivity that we can get using these large rare earths if we can start to tune their coordination sphere and put the right ligands around them. And I'm going to tell you a story about using lactide, which comes from the fermentation of corn. So this is the molecular structure. If you can polymerize it, you open this ring and you make these biodegradable polymer chains. This is polylactic acid. It's the oldest and the most widely used of the renewable polymers. And if we were allowed on campus, you would find that everything, every food item that you buy is wrapped and packaged in polylactide. So it's pretty ubiquitous now. So to make corn into uh, the plastic, we need to use a catalyst to do this. So here is our generic catalyst, and this is what the procedure will involve, of course, simple black box, and out the end comes, well, that's meant to be packaging, but actually um, <laughs> it's, not a, it's not meat, okay? That, that would be a cow uh, to do that. What we're actually thinking about is um, making, uh, using an oxygen-loving catalyst that uh, is going to bind to the oxygen atoms of these um, of these monomers, of these renewable monomers, and enable that ring opening reaction to make these long chain polymers that will make the packaging that is biodegradable. Now, lactide is an interesting molecule because it's one of the ones that nature makes with both hands. So there's a mirror plane here that shows there are two hands and these are asymmetric carbon centers here that have different configurations of the methyl and hydrogen. Now, if you can control the way you polymerize these, you can get much higher, much higher melting points and much better properties out of your product. So what we've been doing in our labs is recognizing that we can use lanthanides in this whole series of 4Fs uh, and organic ligands to stick around them to start to control. So you can see they have strong metal oxygen bonds here. And then they have some other shrubbery to help us control this access to the site. And the nice thing about our catalysts is that what we do is um, we make a, uh, take a whole bunch of these organic bits of shrubbery and we put three per metal around. And if we get the shape and the symmetry right and the size, then we make equal mixtures of left handed and right handed um, molecules from our normal spherical lanthanide because of the way these organic ligands pack around. And I can show you a couple of rotating pictures. This is for the top view of one of our cerium catalysts. And this is the side view. And these ones have picked up carbon dioxide, but that's not important to this right now. And I hope you can see that they have a hand. And so every solution, every time we make the molecule, we make an equal mixture of both hands because um, that preserves um, energy. 
And the nice thing about this system is that we can now take these mixtures of the right, equal amounts of right and left handed catalyst and equal amounts of right and left handed monomer, and we can put them all in the same pot. And instead of just making a jumble, which is what polylactic acid vegware is made of, it's just a random mixture of R's and S's all to get together, and that would be called atactic polymer. What's happening here is one hand of our catalyst polymerizes all of the R monomer, and the other hand of our catalyst polymerizes all of the S monomer. And so we make two separate chains of poly R and poly S. And then because they have opposite symmetry, they can form these um, mixed up telephone wires, if you like, um, a stereo complex of polymer chains that dramatically increases the melting point. So we can increase from 180 to 230 degrees in the melting point of the polymer if we get all these str uh, strands coiled together. So this is a really nice application for our, our carefully tuned, carefully surrounded, ligated lanthanide cations. And we're working further to um, understand the mechanism of how this works so that we can use this catalysis for other things. So I'm going to switch gear and show you some very simple chemistry that we've been doing to try to understand the fundamental structure and bonding of the uranyl dication. So this is the most common form that uranium takes in minerals and in the environment and in seawater in solution. So this linear structure with strong uranium oxygen bonds is present in more than 50% of all known uranium compounds. And according to the textbooks, it's always linear, the bonds are very, very strong, and the oxygens don't do any chemistry. They don't show any reactivity. The electrons on them are all sucked up into this multiple bonding to the uranium, and they're not uh, involved in anything. Um, we want to understand whether this is really true or not, because we know that in the environment, uranyl salts uh, interact with all sorts of different ions um, and in minerals we see this as a beautiful green crystal of torbonite, a copper uranium phosphate mineral. Um, and we know the story isn't so, this simple. There is other literature that tells us this. So one of the reasons that we're interested in deep geological storage of uranyl and all the other nuclear wastes is because we know that deep underground there is a reducing environment. So in the absence of oxygen in air, um, we keep a reduced state and we know that there are electrons that will come in from other minerals like iron containing minerals and microbes that will digest these electrons and digest these uranyl compounds and we form these mixtures. So as we start to add electrons, the oxygens get more reactive um, and we start to form these clusters and eventually we keep uranium away from groundwater, which is important. Um, and so understanding these processes is very important and how they work and when clustering can mess up nuclear waste processing is also important. Um, the, and that's a problem for neptunium and plutonium, these actinar analogs. They're slightly further along in the periodic table, so they have extra electrons. And this makes them oxygen atoms a little bit more reactive and they're more sticky, more likely to donate to other elements. So they do start to form these diamond shaped clusters these T-shaped clusters, and we need to be able to understand them. But studying neptunium and plutonium is difficult because they're significantly more radioactive than uranium. We've been studying uranyl and uranium chemistry for many years, and we have a particular advantage. Because it's isotopically separated, to uh, enriched, to make U-235 for fuels, because this is more fissile, there's a lot of uranium-238 left over. And so this is... Uh, used in um, ballast. So for example, the last time you flew on a plane, which may have been a while ago, um, you were sitting on top of one or two tons of uranium, which was used for weighting the plane correctly. Um, and what this means is that we can work more safely with this. This is one of those rare examples when having something that is depleted, so depleted uranium, is better for you. We, we normally spend a lot of money on things that are enriched, right? But in my group, we're very happy to work with a depleted form. We get a significantly lower dose, and we just have to wear gloves in straightforward procedures. And this is an organic ligand, a structured molecule that we've been using for many years to try to 
um, encapsulate the urinal and start to look at its oxochemistry. So you can see the planar shape here is not correct. When we add urinal, solutions of urinal salts to this, the molecule folds around and it picks up just one. And if you squint hard, I think you might agree that it looks a bit like Pac-Man. Um, so if you can start getting chemistry at one of these oxygen atoms, which we've now desymmetrized, you win 200 points or you get eaten by the ghost. 200. And this is one of the first reactions that we did, actually, that really got us going in understanding oxochemistry. So this is Pac-Man um, reacting with just some basic organic bases that you would use and then throwing in some metal salts. We didn't throw them, obviously. That's not how it works in the lab. Um, but pleasingly for us, uh, the metals provided additional stabilization, but actually none of the electrons, all the electrons that we used to do this came from this uh, silylating agent. So here we have formed the first covalent bond between a uranyl oxo group that's not meant to have any reactivity at all and the silicon. And the oxygen silicon bond is very strong, so that helped us, this gave us a driving force for this reaction. This is the bond in sand, right? Silica, very strong silicon oxygen bonds. And because this molecule was so surprisingly stable, we were able to make a whole series of them, um, grow crystals, take a really close look at where the electrons were, work with computational chemists and understand how the urinal is doing this chemistry. And we proceeded to do a huge amount of other chemistry in these systems. So. Uh, and this is a brief summary of how it works. So this is the whiteboard uh, after a particularly good morning when we realized some of the key things. So we can now bend the urinal oxos out of shape. Um, and that's not just my bad drawing. Um, and we really have a good handle of how we can functionalize. So we can either metallate the urinal oxos now with most of the periodic table, um, or we can put main group elements on so we can make oxygen carbon bonds, we can make oxygen silicon bonds. And we've had a huge amount of both fun and um, learning from doing this over the years. And so what we can now do, now we better understand it, we can work with the really radioactive elements. So um, Neptunium, the next neighbor to uranium, you probably won't have heard of, but you will have all heard of plutonium. So both of these are um, thousands of times more radioactive than uranium, but significantly less radioactive than the next ones along here. And these were um, a real, um, we've been working with these for a few years and the chance to come to Berkeley and to Lawrence Berkeley Labs was uh, really a fantastic opportunity for me to carry on working with these. So um, here's Glenn Seaborg, who um, has had more influence on the periodic table than any other person since Mandelov. So to come here and work in the labs where he discovered plutonium and then did the first chemistry of plutonium, a chemist among physicists in the National Lab of the Hill. This is a phenomenal opportunity for us and a really great chance to push the boundaries of what we really understand about where the electrons go, how the bonding works in all these elements. Right. So um, 
before we go in and do any reaction, of course, we have to think carefully about how safe it's going to be. We do a lot of calculations and a lot of safety procedures and planning. Um, and during uh, sheltering COVID times, you'll be pleased to know that you can do all these at home before you go into the lab. Uh, of course, the banana equivalent that you've probably read about this on the Internet, right? The banana equivalent dose is really just a simple way for people to um, equate a radioactive dose that you would get in the normal environment. And it's nothing to do with working out how we're going to do reactions with neptunium and plutonium. Um, and this is because a certain fraction of potassium has a radioactive isotope. And we use this to remind ourselves that radioactivity is all around us and everything in life is a risk. Um, and what we do as we plan our reactions is completely minimize this risk. And so here are some of the charts. You can see um, how much radioactivity you get from different um, uh, different power generation methods as a result of the naturally occurring isotopes in the fuels. And then there are a few others you can see. So natural rock environments, medical tests, um, dental x-rays. Um, this is a one for all the students who might be watching this to look at. And where, of course, bananas, your potassium in your body is under homeostasis. Just keep an eye on this one because this is cumulative, of course. Right. So what we actually do to do this chemistry is go into specialist facilities and we work with glove boxes that are under negative pressure so that the worker is always being protected and any gas is being pulled away from them uh, and they're wearing they, you can wear lead gloves and you can have general protections and everybody is monitored very very carefully and we work with very small amounts so this is difficult chemistry um, so we can take our urinal compound this is urinal pacna and then we can add an actinide. So this is neptunium or plutonium, or it can also be another uranium. And now we can understand how this oxo chemistry works. And we've been able to bind uh, neptunium and study plutonium binding to these oxo groups here. And here's another crystal structure of this. And we're already beginning to pick apart the differences and understand factors that affect the clustering of these things in the system. So um, this has been a really great uh, chemistry to start. We started this work in Germany and we're really looking forward to carrying on with uh, this sort of work uh, now we're here. Um, there's a problem there, of course. Um, the Pac-Man ligand is exotic. It certainly doesn't exist in the environment and it's not going to be eating nuclear waste for us. Right. So maybe we're not going to help with any of this at all. Um, I could argue against this by saying that where I said it was important to use fancy ligands to control the geometries and the reactivities in the first place so we could understand fundamental structure and bonding. Once we get a handle on it, we can actually now take a step back and realise what the key design elements are for being able to manipulate these systems. So in fact, in the just in the very recent couple of last couple of years, we've been able to get rid of the Pac-Man ligand and go back to this very simple uh, coordinated, solvent coordinated urinal ion. And so here we're working with a very careful choice of solvents. So we're not using water, but we are using um, other oxygenated solvents. And we can do one electron chemistry and we can now put lanthanides, so rare earth elements, onto one or two different oxo groups of urinal. And we can make linear polymers. So we don't just have to make these discrete clusters. We can make linear chains of urinal all through this oxo group chemistry that wasn't meant to happen. And we can do two electron chemistry in the same way. So on the left hand side, we're adding one electron and on the right hand side, we're adding two electrons into these systems. And we're beginning to change the multiple bonding, weakening this urinal oxo, thinking about clustering. And I'll show you the rotation of these structures so you can see where we keep the linearity, what that tells us about where the electrons are and how we can think about understanding these and using the spectroscopy of these pure compounds to help us understand the more complicated spectra of environmental wastes.
So all the electrons and all the orbitals that uh, we have uh, the capabilities to use for the rare earths and the actinides here also give us one other opportunity. If we pick the right ones, and cerium yeah, and uranium happen to be two good examples of this, we can use another feature of the population um, and movement of electrons between orbitals to do something rather exciting. And this is something that we're just getting into uh, um, in an anaerobic environment, so in the absence of air and water. So if you add light energy in this wonderful uh, bolt of uh, light energy into uh, a cerium or a urinal uh, compound, a normal simple salt, you activate a, a light excited state and you turn on what has been termed superoxidant behavior from these. So the process is going on a slightly different in the two particular ions, but we can use them for similar sorts of effects. So this is a, an electron transition from an F orbital to a D orbital, giving that superoxidant power. And this is breaking the uranium oxygen bond, one of the uranium oxygen bonds and popping an electron onto the oxygen atom. So this is one of the urinal compounds we've looked at most recently. And we are actually working in water for this because we found a way to protect the coordination. Um, but we've now made compounds that are soluble in organics. So we can take organic hydrocarbons and it's not as exciting as a rainbow lightning bolt. It's really just a compact fluorescent light bulb. But we can activate the urinal in this and it abstracts these hydrogen atoms. And then we can get controlled conversion of hydrocarbons, CH bonds, into OH bonds. And the important point in the system is for both the cerium and the uranium compounds, because we have organic ligands around them, we can dissolve these things in organic solvents. So now they're organic compatible, we can start to look at um, hydrocarbons. So this is the structure of plastic, this is polyethylene, and of course it has these carbon hydrogen bonds that we desperately want to be able to cleave selectively so we can upcycle plastics and we don't just throw them away. We don't really want to burn them either because that just generates CO2. So we get the right catalysts and we can go in and selectively break CH bonds at certain points along the chain. We can get controlled polymer upcycling and this is something that we're really excited by and we're working very hard on. We've got some great results with uh, cyclic analogues, so cyclohexane, cyclooctene, all of these simple hydrocarbons. And the next step would be to go into these more viscous polymer mixtures, but we're really looking forward to doing that. So I've shown you a lot of molecules here, and I know that only a fraction of you are card-carrying chemists, um, although maybe I've converted some of you into wanting to be chemists. I've shown you um, chemistry where our rare earth catalysts are defined symmetries, allowing us to convert boring corn into rather exciting, potentially engineering quality plastics. I've shown you that um, the textbooks are wrong when they say that urine are oxo groups um, don't react, and in fact they do, and we can get really great control of really simple molecules now that will potentially have interesting magnetic and electronic properties, perhaps quantum interesting properties. Um, and we're also uh, looking to how we can help join in with the polymer upcycling need. There's so much research going on in this area, and it's really important. If we can get selective functionalization of plastics and hydrocarbons, then um, using just simple light activation of these uh, abundant rare earths, then uh, we'll be very happy indeed. And if I have convinced you that it's fun doing rare earth chemistry and actinide chemistry, then um, I, you might want to uh, go on the internet where I found this rather interesting looking kit. So you too can build your own reactor. All you have to do is pop out the plastic pieces and glue them together. And we're assured that this one is meltdown proof, so that should be fine. So. And all that remains for me to do is thank the people who actually do the work. So this is my group, uh, locked and loaded uh, in Edinburgh. Um, uh, they're not wearing lab specs, so you can see they're not actually quite ready to go in the lab, although there's always a fire extinguisher handy when we're around. Um, and these are my amazing pioneers who've come out to Berkeley with me, just standing by the sign. Um, so this was taken, um, well, I guess I've been here for two months in a lockdown, so um, who knows how long that is ago. Very grateful to all these people for funding, uh, very generous funding over many years, um, particularly with ERC, Catalysis Hub, the University of Edinburgh, um, and now uh, fantastic uh, support from University of California, Berkeley, and Lawrence Berkeley Labs, and also the Department of Energy, our Office of Basic Energy Science. And uh, there are a few other things that we're involved in, some um, diversity work, and if you want to listen more, 
to my strange accent, then uh, there are a couple of links there. Maybe you can access them if you would like. Um, thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>